say, Alcid sphincter of our Seraga. I mean, what else can you say? It was a country that had everything, absolutely everything. And now, 20 years later, is what? The world's biggest leper colony. Why? Godlessness. Let me say that again. Godlessness. So, I read that the former United States is so desperate for medical supplies that they have allegedly sent several containers filled with wheat and tobacco. A gesture, they said, of goodwill. You want to know what I think? Right. You're listening to my show, so I will assume you do. I think it's high time we let the colonists know what we really think of them. I think it's payback time for a little tea party they threw for us a few hundred years ago. I say we go down to those docks tonight and dump that crap where everything from the ulcer sphincter of our character belongs. Who's with me? Who's bloody with me? Did you like that? USA, Alcid Sphincter of our Seraga. I mean, what else can you say? It was a country that had everything, absolutely uh, everything. And now, classic. 20 years later, is what? The world's biggest leper colony. Why? So we just wrapped up a uh, Middle Ground Podcast episode, number 29. And uh, I wanted to comment on a certain attitude that I find prevalent amongst us these days. And that is uh, this issue of what does it mean to be an imam or a Muslim scholar today in the day and age of activism and other things? So, I um, there's a person that I had followed online that I had known from my time when I lived in Philadelphia. I knew them and their family. And you know, they're involved in politics. And so their feed, or their, their post had popped up, uh, I think it was yesterday. And of course this is after the news of uh, Joe Biden stepping down from... Uh, yeah, I know it's still playing in the background, it's okay. Um, yeah, you know, this, um, the, 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 the news had come that Joe Biden had stepped down, and then shortly thereafter, um, Kamala Harris was apparently being put forward or being put forth as the, um, the Democratic nominee. And so this person's post, it featured them, it featured them it featured them standing next to Harris, Muslim woman, Muhajjiba, wearing hijab, standing next to uh, Harris and she's smiling and of course now it's like you know and I think had like the hashtag let's go now this is a person that claims to be a part of some sort of black Muslim uh, political forum or collective or something like that and I know this is probably going to really I'm not doing this for this purpose, but this might piss a few people off or rub them the wrong way. But I'm very concerned about where our community, where they're headed, what direction they're going in. And I think in particular amongst black American Muslims, I'm very concerned that our community is heading in a direction Ironically, 
that is towards the very same thing that we used to complain about 20, 30 years ago. Because, you know, I became Muslim in 1991. So I've been, I've been Muslim now for, you know, quite a while. And I've been Muslim for long enough now that I see the irony that, for instance, 20, 30 years ago, it was a common gripe amongst African-American Muslims, amongst black American Muslims. The common gripe was that, man, you know, we got these uh, immigrant Muslims and their culture, and they seem to only understand Islam through their culture, and they put culture first, and they put religion second. And now it would seem that there is a shift within black American Islam kind of towards a similar thing. Where it's all about, you know, Kamala Harris is going to be the first black female president and the first black female this or that. What does it matter if she's the first black anything if what she's going to do is going to be a continuation of the same reprehensible behavior that we saw in the administration that she worked for. And that when I made a critique against this person, which I began by stating with all due respect, and I meant that literally, it was not just simply, uh, I wasn't putting that up just for uh, no good reason, no, I was being very sincere, with all due respect, to put up a picture of you as a, as a Muslim, especially as a Muslim woman who wearing hijab, very visibly Muslim, standing with the vice president, now the presidential nominee, who has been party to all kinds of absolutely horrible and atrocious things that now you're going to put that person and put them up uh, so that they can, uh, you, you can you can stand next to them, essentially like a photo op, right? You're, gonna, you're almost like having a photo op. Now, when I said that I felt that this was shameful, no, I didn't say shame on you, and I didn't call the person, I, I, I didn't refer to them with any kind of derogatory name. I didn't name call them. I didn't call them, you know, a kafir. I didn't call them a munafiq or a hypocrite. I just simply said, shame. This is a shameful act that I don't think Allah Ta'ala would be pleased with for us to stand with somebody that is party to and supportive of a genocide and a war against Muslims. Because there has been a great amount of effort of trying to spin what is happening in Palestine. Well, it's not really about religion. It's not, a th not, not anything to do with Islam. And that spin has not only been from, obviously, from the Zionists and their supporters, whether from the American administration or from the front office in, in, in Tel Aviv. But that has even been the rhetoric from a great many pro-Palestinian secular pro-Palestinian supporters that don't want to make this about Islam and don't want to make this about religion. But it is about religion. Undoubtedly, it is about religion. This is unquestionably a war against Islam. And so when I see somebody standing there lending the symbolic representation of Islam, a woman in hijab, standing next to Kamala Harris, who has, and I'll play the clip, because I just made one the other day, of her going before APAC, bowing before the altar of APAC, pledging her support of APAC, but then when simultaneously asked by a reporter, would you support reparations for the black community? Then she immediately goes into her little, you know, shuck and jive, and all of a sudden now she pulls out her black accent. Nah, I ain't gonna do nothing just for black folk. But when she's in front of her, you know, APAC 
Israeli lobby masters, all of a sudden she has no black accent. <laughs> Her blackness seems to have evaporated. So when she goes in front of APAC, and when she's in front of her white and her Zionist masters, she knows how to speak. But when she's in front of a black journalist talking about, well, what are you going to do for black people? Oh, well, you don't expect for me just to sit up here and do something only for black people, but you'll do something only for Israel. My point being is that when we, you know, when we lend our face and our credibility to these people and smile with them that have been party to the butchering of tens of thousands of children, Muslim children, Muslims, then yes, this is shameful. This is absolutely shameful. And I feel like the very same thing that we used to as black American Muslims, the very same thing that we used to complain about of immigrant Muslims 20 and 30 years ago we are doing the exact same thing now. Well, it's all about, you know, what's good for black people, even though that in itself has, has failed to produce any incontrovertible evidence that the Biden administration would, has, has done anything beneficial for black people. And this is the problem that, once again, we are always having, you know, putting, we're always rolling with, uh, put, putting, putting all of our chips on lucky number seven that they're going to, somehow uh, do this or that. So this person's rebuttal was, well, you know, uh, anybody that does, anybody that says, I don't consider Trump to be the greater to evil, then you're an imbecile. And so my point, as I said in the beginning, like, what is it to be imam in our community anymore? What is it to be scholar in our community anymore? It seems to me that to be a, an imam or a scholar in the Muslim community is basically only to be used in a one-way transaction. That when you can be co-opted, when your optics can be co-opted, when your signature can be co-opted to support whatever cause it is, as it relates to that, in this case, some, 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 some issue that is important for black folks or black American Muslims, okay, fine. When we support that, then it's like we're sort of legitimized. But the minute that we are maybe a little bit critical or say, you know what, I don't think that that is something that would be the correct thing to do as a Muslim, or I don't think that Allah Ta'ala would, be, would be, be happy with us if we did that, or perhaps we should not do that as Muslims. Then, oh, well, look at these imams. This is why the imam, we don't need imams, or these imams are irrelevant, or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so we're often, uh, then we're labeled as uh, traitors, or... Because as a black American Muslim, I care about what's happening to other Muslims in another part of the world that don't happen to be black. Well, now uh, I'm some sort of race traitor because I care about what's happening with our brothers and sisters in Palestine um, as if I cannot be concerned with my own folks here and also what's happening abroad. Or that my concern for my people may, and this might shock some people, like, the thing that I'm most concerned about is Islam. And the thing that I care the most about are the Muslims. Even if that is not reciprocated by other Muslims. Meaning that, okay, I might care more about the blood of the Muslims than I might about my own people here, because not all of my own people here on American soil are Muslim. And the blood of the Muslims is more sacrosanct to me, more important to me than the blood of non-Muslims. And that if I speak in this rhetoric, oh, well, I, I'm some sort of sellout. I'm some sort of racial sellout. Uh, and like as Ernst said, right, and then we're always given this speech about the lesser of two evils. Well, these are all things that are subjective. And as I even said to the person, I said, if you want to make the claim that voting for Kamala Harris or any other Democratic any other Democratic candidate is the lesser of two evils. Even though I might personally disagree with that, okay, fine. And you say, okay, that's what I'm going to do because I feel like that's the lesser of two evils. All right, fine. Why, though, does that necessitate you to stand with them and smile 
and give them a platform and give them a level of uh, legitimacy that almost is like, do you have some sort of either amnesia about what has happened since October? Secondly, when we ask to demand to actually see some concrete evidence of how this administration has been better for black folks, and when other people, not myself, and when other people say, well, maybe the other administration, they could have done some things. Well, they say, well, yeah, well, it wasn't done. They don't really care about black people like this administration really cares about black people. In fact, it would seem that whether it's the Obama administration or whatnot, it seems like they've certainly done far more for the LGP, LGBTQ community than they have done for the black community. And yet when we want to say, well, mm, we're not 100% sure about that, then we are the ones that are labeled as somehow you know, race traitors. And so again, like, what does it really mean? Like, what does it mean to be imam or a scholar in our community if we are only basically recognized as such to the extent that we go along with agendas? That on one hand, you can be, uh, you can be insulted and labeled a scholar for dollar. So you have people like um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf that are labeled a trader and a scholar for dollar for supposedly receiving money from the uh, UAE. And to my knowledge, there has not been any incontrovertible evidence that supports whether or not that is actually true or not, that you know, he has actually received. But whether or not the perception is so, and so he's labeled scholar for dollar. And I say this is not somebody that is uh, a Hamza Yusuf fanboy. I just got through saying this in the podcast we wrapped up. It's not about me being pro Sheikh Hamza or anti Sheikh Hamza. As I've said, there are things that are definitely criticizable that he said, but he is still my Muslim brother. Just as my sister, she did what she did. I thought it was in very poor taste, I thought it was in misguidance. She's still my sister in Islam. I don't see where I went beyond uh, the pale of, of what is considered respectability. And that's what I'm saying. If, if as a scholar or an imam, unless you were only singing people's praises, unless you are only agreeing to go along lock, stock, and barrel uh, with somebody's agenda or plan without due consideration of whether that plan is either in congruence or or actually maybe incongruence with the teachings of Islam, then somehow, you know, the, uh, the, then you're a scholar for dollar or you're irrelevant or you're a race trader. This, what does it mean then? Like, what is the use? What is the utility of scholarship if it cannot remain neutral? That it cannot reserve the right to critique? And why is all critique interpreted and received as essentially some kind of slash and burn that if I critique you uh, as an imam, if I critique you uh, uh, from the point of view thinking that this is not something that uh, is good for us, that somehow now uh, we can't, that we're, <laughs> that we're going to actually disobey the command of Allah to not split up. All of you grab onto the rope of Allah uh, and don't split up. Now because I'm criticizing your actions, which are political actions, now it's as if uh, we can't have anything to do with one another. This is a really disturbing trajectory for us to continue to go in where our community does not follow knowledge anymore. Our community does not respect knowledge anymore. In my conversation today with a friend of mine, Omar, uh, who works here in the building, um, I, I was mentioning, you know, he was asking, why is it that Muslims don't do A, B, and C, or X, Y, and Z? Because Muslims 
don't follow knowledge. Muslims will hold each other's feet to the fire, not on aqa'id of the religion, not on principles from the religion, like do you pray five times a day? You know, do you fast? Do you do this or that? Do you adhere to the the awamr and the ahkam Qur'aniya wa nabawiyya? Do you ad ad adhere and, 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 and adhere to the commandments both from Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an and from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, that is a person's personal discretion as to how religious they will be or how religious they will not be. But now you will hold my feet to the fire on some alleged lesser of two evils thing or that Trump, you know, we must stop Trump at any cost. I am not a fan of Donald Trump. I would not vote for Donald Trump, just to make that clear. I'm neither a fan of him. I think he's a horrible human being. I think he's a liar, a philanderer. He's an absolute moral nightmare. And I would, I would not vote for Donald Trump. That being said, I am not convinced that he is in some way any worse than the other administration. And I think what people are conflating for is that he's just simply more obvious, but not necessarily any worse. I think a good example of this is how Barack Obama, how he was perceived during his presidency, and even how he's perceived now. He was the drone striker, drone striker in chief that killed all kinds of people with impunity and with no provocation and no justification whatsoever, but he's the first black president. As if that means anything. What, do, what, what, what does the first black president or a black president or first black female, what do any of those things mean in the face of wanton killing? What do any of those things mean? Uh, let's see, somebody kind of said, they do a great job of selling snake oil filled with promises of what they're going to do for us. And we do a better job spending our own collective power. It's true. I mean, they're always selling us. I mean, I think I saw an ad or some soundbite in which Joe Biden was like, well, you know, if you don't vote for me, Trump is going to take away your reproductive freedoms. Well, if you're referring to Roe v. Wade, that happened under your watch. So how, if, if you're the kind of person that believes in the blank check for abortion, which I don't, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not the, uh, maybe a very particular conservative that believes uh, in that there's no, uh, no issue of that. But just putting that all aside, it happened on his watch. So why are, why are those that would take the lesser of two evil stance? They never seem to hold anybody to account. That's my issue, is that you're so busy about things being the lesser of two evils that you never hold power to account. So the only thing you could think of is opposing Donald Trump, but not holding these people that have power now to account. How are you going to hold Kamala Harris to account for the atrocities that she has co-signed her name to if you're so busy celebrating the fact that she's the first black president, first black female president, first black female presidential nominee? Now, if, that, if we're dealing with a white man, let's just be honest, if we're dealing with a white man like Donald Trump, well, then now we've got to speak truth to power. See, this is the problem with all this black girl magic and all this other thinking that tends to disable our moral intelligence. When are we going to actually hold all, all power to authority? When will we hold all power to authority? Not just those that happen to offend our sensibilities more than others. 
Because that's what I feel like now, we are just simply left with emotional sensibilities and we no longer have morality. We no longer have things that are divinely mandated uh, morality, points of morality, but now we just have emotional sensibilities. This to me is disgusting. I mean, let's see if I can bring this up really quick. This thing where she is, let me see if I can bring this up. This was, this was absolutely disgusting. I got to see if I can bring in the uh, chrome here really quick. All right, here we go. So hopefully you guys can hear this. Now this is a clip I've put up on our Middle Ground YouTube channel. Now this is a clip of Kamala Harris. And it's a mix, like she's, on one hand, she's giving a speech to, to APAC. We all know who that is, right? The Zionist lobby. In which she speaks in normal white English no urban or black inflection whatsoever. But then when she's questioned by another appears to be African-American or black American uh, female journalist that asks her about reparations, suddenly now she's got to pull out her blackness to appeal to that particular audience. Hopefully you can at least Good morning, APAC. Good morning. What an honor. We must stand with Israel. You used to uh, on the case of media. And again Good morning, APAC. Good morning. What an honor. We must stand with Israel. Do you support reparations for black people? So I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No. Which is why I support the United States commitment to provide Israel with thirty-eight billion dollars in military assistance over the next decade. So I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No. I support full funding for Israel, including for the Arrow, David Sling, and the Iron Dome missile defense systems with a lie. So I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. And that's why I am fully committing to maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge. So I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. I stand here clear eyed about the dangers of division in our country and in our world, understanding why a state for the Jewish people is so essential. Good morning, APAC. Good morning. Good morning, APAC. What? Where, where? Where did all of the? Where did all the hot sauce? Where did all of the? Uh, you know, where did the electric slide, the gravy? Where did all that go? It disappeared. That's what I mean about this pandering. And and for me also, when when our sister is standing there, posing with her, this is just. This is really disappointing. And again, I think this is this is the tough part that if you want to have real leadership in the community, number one, leadership in Islam is based upon the leader of the Muslim community, which is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the model of leadership in the Muslim community. Therefore, according to his own statements, right, that the ulama, they are going to be the inheritors of that. And so any form of leadership in our community must be based upon knowledge and also to have the right to critique others of what they are doing. Again, critique is not the same as like burning somebody's house to the ground, but rather just simply pointing out that this is a mistake, this is an error. And yet we seem to have lost the ability to take any kind of advice from our imams or any kind of advice from scholars, that scholarship is only legitimate or useful as it can be applied to agendas in the minute that it actually might speak out against that agenda or against that group's uh, whatever their their aims are then suddenly uh, you know 
you're you're not legit or you have to go. So we we need to do some deep digging here and think about what what kind of create what kind of future are we creating for Islam in America in which religious authority is no longer in the hands of those that have legitimate Islamic knowledge? What kind of future are we creating when imams and scholars are no longer uh, free to be able to criticize and direct the community? What kind of future are we creating in which um, authority is simply all based upon uh, either a blind desire for power or an equally blind fear of power that forces us to make decisions that are ultimately not going to be for the pleasure of Allah. So I think we got some real we got some real thinking to do here. So gesture they said of I'll let this one take you, you out I want to know what I think well, you're listening to my show so I will assume you do I think it's high time we let the colonists know what we really think of them I think it's payback time for a little tea party they threw for us a few hundred years ago I say we go down to those docks tonight and dump that crap where everything from the ocean sphincter of our Serica belongs who's with me who's bloody with me did you like that USA, Al Sud Sphincter of Arserica. I mean, what else can you say?